The village of English Bay is perched on the tip of the Kenai Peninsula, 200 miles south of Valdez. It's one of several communities whose main sources of food are fishing and subsistence gathering, activities that have been curtailed since the oil spill. Although Exxon has supplied canned food, much of it is going unused because it's not the food that residents traditionally eat. It really hurts everybody here. All them uh, smoke houses are empty here. All seem comes right into the uh, lagoon entrance over there. And, uh, you know, we do pick a lot of uh, seafoods down there. We don't trust them now. We don't want to take a chance. Elderly people, you know, sometimes you go up to them and they'd be angry, you know. They want their, uh, their uh, native food back, you know. They don't want that money and sometimes it's hard to talk to them, you know. 450 miles away in southeast Alaska, Angoon residents, untouched by the spill, have launched a major effort to gather 10,000 pounds of subsistence food for shipment to oiled villages. The Sea Team Project, sponsored by the State Department of Community and Regional Affairs, Exxon, the City of Angoon, and the Clinkett Haida Regional Indian Council, is a summer youth employment program. Village elders instruct their young people in the traditional ways of subsistence gathering, hunting, and fishing. Some people are really devastated, you know, more so than other people are, and I'm just glad it never happened to us, and I feel pretty good about it. I'm getting paid really well for it, but, you know, I think if it really came down to it, I'd do it anyway for not with any money. One of the major importances of the food is that I think it, it's a shared cultural heritage that uh, the native villages in Alaska, uh, subsistence people in general, uh, gather food from the land. Uh, although these are different tribes in the different villages, we have different tribes here and, and there are different tribes in those villages, it gives us that we have a shared responsibility, I think, and a shared stake in the spill, and I think this reflects it. Lack of subsistence food could be dangerous. Psychologists believe there's potential for serious depression in those villages hit by the spill, due in part to vitamin deficiencies resulting from a dramatic change in diet and the lack of cultural activities revolving around subsistence food gathering and preparation. It's a loss of a way of life. It's hard for people to understand that. They think that we have a choice between uh, the foods that we gather and prepare or going to the store. That isn't so. I think we prefer the foods that we gather and prepare, only because of the social activity, our way of life, the way we interact with each other. If you take that away, they can never go out and buy what they've lost. When the oil tanker Flying Clipper approached the Nikiski refining terminal on the Kenai Peninsula in Cook Inlet, it was met by some 20 fishing vessels that had formed a blockade, refusing its entry into port. The fishermen, calling themselves frustrated independent salmon harvesters, or fish, are trying to create pressure on oil companies in hopes of getting a serious oil cleanup effort in Cook Inlet underway. The group's fishing season was officially closed last week due to oil from the Exxon Valdez. Two years ago, it was the same story when a smaller oil spill in Cook Inlet ruined their season, depriving them of a living. As the tanker approached the blockade, the captain radioed the Coast Guard asking for instructions what to do. Okay, I've got a maneuver uh, to keep from hitting these docks, and uh, if I have a choice, it'll be either the boat or the dock. Yeah, well, I understand that. Uh, people have been warned they're, they're playing chicken with you now is the best way to put it. Uh, go ahead and proceed slowly and uh, plan on a tie -up. When the people that own these oil companies can stand on the dock and tell a pilot or a skipper of a huge boat like the Flying Clipper tonight, just keep going regardless of the people in front of it, just run over them. He didn't say run over them, but he said just keep it coming. So what's the difference? I mean, three seconds and he would have killed four people tonight. Nikiski, located some 300 miles from where the Exxon Valdez went aground, is outside of the area Exxon has said it is willing to clean up. Therefore, very little is being done to handle the massive volume of oil that has polluted Cook Inlet. It hit the beaches and now it's sneaking around here. It's like a black, slimy evil. It's affecting more and more lives all the way and Exxon is gonna have to pay the piper. I don't see him talking to anyone. I don't see him interviewing anyone. I don't see him visiting anyone to find out how much harm they have done. And it's, it's, it's disgusting. They've less, left us up in the air as far as any other work we can do. I can't, as far as I know to this date, go 
to the shoe store and sell shoes because they want to mitigate that money that I make and take it off of the compensation that they're offering me. I can't work for fishing and I can't work other than fishing. We need the state's backing. We need the backing of the Congress of the United States and the American people as well. The fishermen of this region are not only concerned about this year's lost fishing season, but about future closures due to inadequate oil cleanup abilities. And they're at their wits end. And we just feel it's time to push back. The oil companies have pushed us in the corner. We've got no place to go. We're broke. If somebody takes your livelihood away from you, you just have to fight. And I, and I don't know how to fight. I mean, this is the only way I knew how to do it. Following the grounding of the Exxon Valdez, the immediate effects of the spill on the geography and wildlife in Prince William Sound were evident. But only now, more than five months later, is the toll on the human population becoming known. As the slick grew, so too did the alarming statistics. A recent survey by the Alaska Department of Health and Social Services shows that those communities with substance abuse programs have seen admissions double since the spill. In Cordova, for instance, mental health referrals are up 28 percent. In Kodiak, up 50 percent. In Homer, where domestic violence has increased 1,000 percent, city officials, health care professionals, and residents are coping with a disaster that doesn't seem to end. You don't know if the fishermen are going to be fishing. You don't know what the economy is going to do. You don't know what property values are going to do. You don't know whether more oil is going to come into the bay. And in the month of July so far, we've had a 114 percent increase in our referrals. I believe that that has to do with the oil spill, with uncertainty, with unemployment. Our crimes of violence have increased substantially. It's uh, not only assaults and things of that nature, we're having a lot more uh, domestic disputes, we're having a lot more bar fights. People just don't realize what it's like to have your whole livelihood jeopardized, not just one year, but maybe the next five years. I haven't gone down to the beaches, I haven't gone down to look because I have to keep it together to deal with people here in the agency, and that's hard. Emotionally, it's been a real travesty. I've had a recurring nightmare since the end of April, since the first time I sat down on a beach and had oil up to my knees. I haven't slept more than four hours in any one night for the last four months. This is the third largest man-made disaster outside of wartime in the entire history of the human race. This is surpassed outside of wartime only by Bhopal and Chernobyl. This is going to have some very, very long-term scars on the people that live here. The state of Alaska has developed a strike force of mental health and family counseling workers that will be in the field most of this winter. The lesson for other states in preparing for a disaster of this kind is to do a considerable amount of contingency planning for humans as well as wildlife and the environment. We're protesting unresponsible development. If the oil industry is going to do business in this state, keep your promises. It's unusual because this is the only state in the nation that allows foreign flag supertankers to carry oil from one of its ports. This tanker today specifically is Israeli registered, Liberian flagged, and Italian crewed. So if this tanker or one of the other foreign flag supertankers hits Bly Reef or has a tanker spill, who would pay? We're hoping that Congress makes industry responsible for any and all risks associated with marine transport of oil. If they want to bring in foreign flag tankers, that's fine, but post a bond. Be finan have the financial resources to deal with a spill up front. I mean, we want to know where that money's going to come from, and we want the oil industry to assume the risks. It's their game. They're talking about demobilization and pulling out from the cleanup, and everyone's attention is focused on the beach cleanup. And there's so much more to it than that. A large part of the problem is cleanup of state and federal legislation to prevent something like this from ever happening again. So we need to refocus people's attention on what's really going to be effective in preventing something like this from happening again. They have the technology to be doing things better than they're doing, like at the terminal. Keep up to date. Keep, keep the technology state of the arts. 
It's, it's an attitude problem. We want this attitude changed.